eighth grade U.S. history. Welcome to the second day of class. Now, I wanted to start off by telling you guys a little story while well, I hand these primary sources out. The other day, um, over the weekend, I was at the mall. I like to go there to eat at the food court, and I happened to overhear a couple of other eighth graders. I don't think they were from this school. They were talking about a class called U.S. Studies. Anyway, they were complaining about it, and they were complaining about the textbook. And one of the points they brought up that I thought was very interesting is, how do they know what happened if it was so long ago? How do they remember it? Well, there's an answer to that. Primary sources. You see, history textbooks and history itself is created through primary sources. Does anyone know what a primary source is? Go ahead, Josh. A person who experienced the event. A person. A person could certainly be a primary source. Perhaps something they wrote down in a diary or a journal that happened at the time. Anyway, my point is, there really isn't a right or a wrong to what you need to learn from history. Just because I say a person or a place or event is important doesn't necessarily mean that it's important to you. That's why, before we even start <coughs> reading from the textbook, I want to show you guys what primary sources are, because even you can create history through them. So take a look at uh, what I've got on the table there. Primary sources, because some of them are so, from so, um, so long ago, we uh, really need to model some, some reading strategies so that as I have you guys look at these, you can get the most information out of them. So um, we're going to read this primary source together. I'm going to start and I'm going to model for you what I do when I read a primary source so that I can get the most amount of information out of it. And then you are going to read the, uh, the second page of it and uh, do some of these strategies yourself. So before we even begin reading, let's look at the title. Excerpt from Martin Luther King's Letter from a Birmingham Jail, 1963. Does anyone know what might have been happening in Birmingham? Does anyone know where Birmingham is? Alabama. Alabama, down in the South. What was going on down in the South in 1963, in the 1960s? That's right, the Civil Rights Movement. Now, this is a letter written by Martin Luther King, Jr. What do we know about Martin Luther King? He had a dream. Yes, he had a dream. He was a civil rights leader. <laughs> He was a major civil rights leader. All right, let's begin. My dear fellow clergymen, well confined here in Birmingham City Jail. Now, why was King arrested? Could I find that out? It doesn't say in the letter right away. So that's something that we want to keep in mind to look up later. But I'll tell you right now, it was because the court prohibited him from, um, the, pro the court prohibited the marches and protests that were taking place, and he was arrested. So were a lot of protesters. <laughs> I came across your recent statement calling my present activities unwise and untimely. Seldom do I pause to answer criticism of my work and ideas. If I sought to answer all the criticisms that crossed my desk, my secretaries would have little time for anything other than such correspondence in the course of the day, and I would have no time for constructive work. But since I feel that you are men of genuine good and that your criticisms are sincerely set forth, I want to try and answer your statements in what I hope will be patient and reasonable terms. So, he's writing from jail. Can you guys imagine what it must feel like? Can you guys try to imagine it anyway? I'm sure most of you have not been to jail. What it must feel like to be in an Alabama jail cell in 1963, cold, dark. Why is this letter not more angry? Well, that's because King um, was practicing and the, the protests at the time were nonviolent. Um, let's continue. I think I should indicate why I'm here in Birmingham, since you have been influenced by the view which argues against outsiders coming in. I have the honor of serving as president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, an organization operating in every southern state with headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia. We have some 85 affiliated organizations across the South, and one of them is the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. Frequently, we share staff, educational, and financial resources with our affiliates. Several months ago, an affiliate here in Birmingham asked us to be on call to engage in nonviolent direct action program if such were deemed necessary. We readily consented, and because I was invited here, I am here because I have organizational ties here. So this paragraph is saying, even though 
they called him an outsider. He's not because he's representing a cause that is relevant across the entire country. It isn't something that is just taking place in Birmingham. <coughs> but more basically, I'm in Birmingham because the injustices, because injustice is here. Just as the prophets of the 8th century BC left their villages and carried their, thus said the Lord, far beyond the boundaries of their hometowns, and just as the Apostle Paul left his village of Tarsus and carried the gospel of Jesus Christ to the far corners of the Greco-Roman world, I am compelled to carry the gospel of freedom beyond my own hometown. Like Paul, I must constantly respond to the Macedonian call for aid. So, we see a lot of biblical quotes here. Do you remember who he's writing to? The clergyman. So he's uh, taking a religious appeal to them. He's trying to, you know, why, why are you against me? And using that. Okay, I'm going to read one more paragraph. You deplore the demonstrations taking place in Birmingham, but your statement, I am sorry to say, fails to express a similar concern for the conditions that brought about the demonstrations. I am sure that none of you would want to rest content with a superficial kind of social analysis that deals merely with effects and does not grapple with underlying causes. It is unfortunate that demonstrations are taking place in Birmingham, but it is even more unfortunate that the city's white power structure left by the neighbor left the neighbor community with no alternative. So here we can infer that King is writing to persuade the clergy in Birmingham to his reasons for wanting freedom for his people, and he's accusing them of not fighting for what is right, fighting for what they should be standing for. Now I want you guys to read. Turn, turn the turn the, the letter over. I want you in group of two to go ahead and read the. Uh, the rest of that aloud and model some of those reading strategies I was doing for you. So ask what it's about. You try to summarize each paragraph. If there's something you need clarification on, remember it so that you can look it up later so that you can ask your partner. And uh, go ahead. <laughs> A partner? No, I'm uh, okay. Then last September, the Minneapolis Union talked to leaders in Birmingham's economic development. In the course of the negotiations, the promises were made by the merchants for a tailored journey. The story is humiliating racial stories. On the basis of these promises, the Reverend Lloyd Wright Shuttles were the leaders of the Alabama Reverend Shuttles. We were to a war on all the issues. As weeks and months went by, we realized that we were the big means were for all the promises. Each side to make their move and charge others. We had a little bit of a problem. So many of us turned into the world's number one. We had a little bit of a problem. And the Wall Street were presented by the very direct action of my boots. So the Wall Street were presented by the very direct action of my boots.
I never got it. That was not it. What are you talking about? <laughs> Yeah. 